This episode may contain spoilers, sensitive topics, and us laughing at our own jokes. So don't say we didn't warn you. Hey, everybody. Welcome to episode two. You got Willow here. You got Rocio here. Rocio, what's going on? Nothing is going on besides we're going to read this book. Or we read it already, right? You we, read it? I, <laughs> did you read it? I read it. Did I read it? Yeah, I, I did read it. Um, I did read it. Uh, y'all are going to have to bear with us. We are in. Here we are. We are in a mood today. Um, we're a great start. Well, this is actually how we are all the time. So this is not even This is even a, it's not even a mood. Um... So, yeah, here we go. We are talking today about Winter in the Blood by James Welch. James Welch was born in Browning, Montana in 1940 and was raised on the Blackfeet and Fort Belknap reservations. Um, His father was of the Blackfeet tribe and his mother was of the, I already forgot how to say it, Grovant. Mm -hmm. Is that how you say it? Grovant tribe each. And they both had Irish ancestry. Uh, They briefly moved to Minneapolis and that's where he graduated from high school and then he briefly went to university of minnesota and then i think he i think they moved back to montana and then he went to the university of montana and graduated with a degree in liberal art is that a degree in liberal arts what yeah is, what we got a degree in liberal arts yeah but like master of arts but it says a bachelor's it's liberal arts like what he is yeah. that just what it was called yeah, because we went to a school. Why we went to school of liberal arts, and then there's schools of science, or there's BAs and there's BS. But since we're bis- bachelor's of science, business of uh, arts, <laughs> we graduated. We graduated, <laughs> and I'm just trying to figure out. Like, I guess I was looking for his major, but are uh, they saying his degree is in liberal arts? Because we wouldn't say our degrees in liberal arts. We say our degrees in like our majors. But anyway, he went to college. <laughs> Um, and then he also, in 1966, he was awarded the National Endowment of the for the Arts grant. Uh, and this led to the publication of his first collection of poems, Riding the Earth Boy, 40 Poems, and that was in 1971. He passed away in 03 in, in Montana. Uh, Winter in the Blood has f- like 40, we're going to say 42 chapters, because it's not written in a way that looks traditional when it comes to Mm -hmm. chapters is they're just the numbers are just kind of there like on half the page and a quarter of the page whatever but it is divided into four parts plus the epilogue yeah and this book was written or published in 1974 and again if you didn't see or watch the episode not watch if you didn't hear the episode last time we will be talking about some context and some plot so if you don't want to get it spoiled spoiled that's not it. If, if you don't want the if you don't want the plot to be spoiled, yeah, yeah, then don't listen to this. There will also be talk about some death and uh, violence throughout the book. Yes. So, quick summary: In Winter, we got this from Penguin Random House, the publishing people. In Winter in the Blood, Welch tells the story of a nameless, aimless young man who attempts to track down an absconding girlfriend. I don't know what absconding means. An absconding girlfriend led led him. Is that a sentence? I don't know. Well, <laughs> <laughs> Welch tells the story of a nameless, aimless young man who attempts to track down an absconding girlfriend. Led him. That led him. That led him on an ah Jesus. That led him on an odyssey of beer drenched encounters, one night stands, and improbable mock intrigues. That's very. It's very fancy yeah. the way they wrote that. Only when the narrator seeks the counsel of an old blind Indian named Yellow Calf does he begin to grasp the truth of his origins and thus the deeper significance of his life. <sighs> great, 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 great. <laughs> this book is set in the 1960, ugh, 1960s. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and um, the location, so it is set on the Fort Belknap Indian Reservation, which again, that's where the author was raised. Um, a little bit about the reservation. It's the fourth largest reservation in Montana. Uh, it's over 600,000 acres. Full stop. That's the end of my sentence. I was going to say long, but that doesn't make any sense. Uh, oh, hey, yo. That's what she's... Anyway, it is home to two tribes, the Nakota tribe and the 
a Cinnaborn tribe. Mm-hmm. I'm so glad you looked that up before we got into this. Um, and it currently has 7,000 enrolled registered members. It was also established in the late 1800s. Um, I, I did a little bit of research on like indigenous slash Indian culture because we wanted to make sure that we're using the right terms. Um, Welch referred to himself as an Indian and many people of his generation and older generations would, re- would refer to themselves as Indian, not Native American, and probably not indigenous. So here's all of what I found. Um, although... <clears throat> <clears throat> yeah, I do have water right here. Um, I didn't drink it though. Although Native American is the term that most of us are taught to use because, right, that's like more PC or whatever. American Indian and Indigenous are more preferred. Um, I got this from the FAQ section of the uh, National Museum of the American Indian website. But they also said some older people will remain loyal to the term Indian because they see Native American as a term that the government which they don't like usually, uh, assigned to them. Thus, colonization, thus, or a la colonization, a la uh, Americanization. Like their use of the word Indian is a rejection of the government um, and the rejection of the term Native American. So, you know, we have those terms like Hispanic or I'm trying to think of other ones that, that they just, people just like group a lot of groups, uh, a lot of ethnic groups into, but Native American is a blanket term. Um, and it was created decades ago to include all Native people in the country. Um, Ali Young, who is a citizen of the Navajo Nation and the founder of a nonprofit called Protect the Sacred, she says, quote, I prefer Dine, which means the people in our language, over Navajo, which is a Spanish name given to us by those who colonized our communities. So all in all, in conclusion. In conclusion, let's just normalize asking people what they would want to be called. So if you do know someone who is Native, Indian, Indigenous, whatever they want to be referred to as, um, just go one step further and ask them what their tr- tribe is and if that is something they want to be called, if that's how they want to be identified. Yeah, agreed. Uh, moving on to the historical context around this book. Uh, so the Indian uh, individuals were taking their cue from the civil rights and the Black Power movement, and with that, Native Americans or Indians in the 1960s and 1970s became more assertive in their efforts to preserve their culture and improve their economic situation. So this is something that's going on during the time that this book is written, or more likely uh, when the book, the set time frame that the book is supposed to take place in. The importance of the book title. So it is called Winter in the Blood. And according to Encyclopedia.com, Winter in the Blood suggests that the blood in the narrator runs thin. He suffers, he suffers from a kind of spiritual and mental anemia, which will make more sense as we talk more about the book. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, let's just go through. We have this little note. We, let's, let's start with, um, we could do like some quick summaries of, of the four different parts of the book. So in the first part, we meet the main character whose name we never find out um no one in the book refers to him as anything or like ever says his name which i would feel like is kind of hard to do yeah. um as an author like not even his his mom or stepdad yeah like no one ever calls him by his name mm-hmm. um in the movie they gave him a name but no one said it anyway we learned that both his dad and his brother have passed away his father passed away um as he's coming back from days of drinking in the bars uh quote making the white men laugh Uh, And it doesn't seem like he has a close relationship with his mother. So we find out that his dad passed away. They, I think they found him Mm -hmm. like dead in the cold one day. And then his brother died from uh, an accident while they were like riding horses or something. Yeah. Like herding from stuff. Yeah. (laughs) In the second part, the narrator goes to find his wife. <clears throat> which we also find out <laughs> which we also happening find out today that is not actually his wife at the end of the book like he's like i'm actually gonna marry her this time but anyways he refers to her <laughs> right. as his wife who left the house with his gun and razor uh he also refers to her as the fish that he brought to dinner because he doesn't really care for her anyways yeah matter. he he says i just brought this woman home yeah but everyone refers to her as his wife i didn't yeah. even yeah and then during this time uh, when he goes to find his wife, he meets a criminal 
or as he calls him, an airplane man, who asks him to drive to Canada. The plan for this is basically the, narr the narrator gets to keep the car and money that the airplane man is going to buy, and as long as he is able to distract the police from the airplane man, mean <laughs> from the <airplane laughs> to ensure he makes it to Canada and the way he is supposed to distract the police is because he is an Indian he will be harassed by the police so while the police is harassing him the airplane man will be able to he's gonna go make through. a run for it <laughs> yeah. that's their plan I, I, like I know that's what happened because we read it but hearing it summarized is, yeah. is a lot more we, oh, yeah. crazy um, in part 3 the narrator's grandmother dies which triggers memories of the death of his brother um, so to explain a little bit about what happened to his brother Mose Mose was hit by a car while they were herding the cows across an interstate um, the, the narrator feels guilty for Mose's death because it seems like he loses control over the horse and his brother attempts to help and so the car comes and hit his brother so he he felt like it was it was his fault um it was portrayed a little bit differently in the movie that's not quite how they yeah. i'm picturing it in my head that's not quite how they did it but we'll get to the movie later yeah. um in that accident the narrator falls off the horse and injures his knee which will always remind him of that day and his brother's death he brings it up a lot in the book um, that he has a hard time walking and that his knees always hurting and giving him pain and that is yeah it's a constant reminder of his brother what happened uh the guilt it also brings up his father's death as well yeah so there's a lot of death that has happened into he's 32 years old this is something also important to say that he's 32 years old but he is treated as a teen or a young adult uh they call him what do they call him boy or yeah they refer to him as if he's a kid and it's not until he tells us yeah or he says to another too. character he's like i'm 30 something years old and they're like yeah whatever you're a boy yeah so anyways, in part four, he discovers that Yellow Calf is actually his grandfather and not the white man he, his grandmother had married. So this is important because throughout the book, he has, he mentions that he's not, a, or he mentions that he's half white, half Indian. And that is also uh, adds to his identity crisis. So when he finds out that he's actually full Indian, that sets a different tone for the book as well. And then in the epilogue, his grandmother is being buried. Um, they have a funeral with just Teresa, which is his mom, and the weird guy that she marries. What's his name? Um, Lame Bull. Lame Bull. So Lame Bull basically just married Teresa to... It's my have, least favorite character. ...to get some ownership of the land. But anyways, um, but then at that point, he seems to be ready to move on and be happy after everything he's gone through. Um, so then the story ends with just a happy and positive note for him because again he finds out that he is a full indian not half white uh yeah the grandmother is buried the i can't I start looking at you <laughs> anyway the narrator starts to plan his future he decides to see a doctor for his knee and he also plans to reconcile with his wife who was not really his wife but he plans on <laughs> marrying her and that should be his wife in conclusion, it ends with a happy note. In conclusion. Therefore. So forth. Yeah. Um, let's go back, Rocio, to the to part four, because I want to bring up, we should probably talk about the, I'll give like a, a, a list of characters. Um, and if you think I remember the names, I don't. So I'm going to go to encyclopedia.com, see what they have to say. Characters. So we got the we got the narrator, whose name, again, we don't, we don't know his name. Um we have Agnes, I think. The Agnes wife. is the is the wife girlfriend. Who's not a wife? Who's the woman? The fish. Fish out of the water. What did he call her? I don't know. We didn't even talk about the fish. Yeah. Also, every analysis that I looked at never mentioned the fish, but in the book they talk about the fish <laughs> not being there, and maybe we're just missing a lot, or maybe we just missed it. But what what's up with the fish not being there? Is that right. symbolism of like the white man came, colonized, and took away, or like tear like? Hurt the nature and the fish. I mean, probably. I, I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm curious as to why that never came up because that was a big part. There were several parts in the book where the narrator was talking to another character about there not being fish in any of the bodies of water yeah. on the reservation or like in, like in around the reservation, and that came up a lot. Yeah, and then the white guy or the airplane man was like, "No, there is fish. I was there. I got fish." Right, and I was like, like no, "What? No, no, where wasn't. are you?" But, I mean, I, we, we can't tell because we weren't there, so. <laughs> okay, so we got Agnes. 
Um, let's just read some of these descriptions. Agnes is a slender young Cree woman from Haver. She is the narrator's girlfriend who lives with him and his family for three weeks. The narrator's grandmother hates her because she is Cree. Right? We forgot about that. The narrator's grandmother was not a fan of Agnes. Um, she leaves, takes his gun and his razor. <gasps> oh yeah, that's important because the gun is has symbolism or importance with his brother. Right. Kind of like similar if you know about you know what we read last time with. Holden. The book that will not be mentioned. You would not discuss him. But with, if you remember, Holden had a close relationship with this mitt or glove because of his brother's death. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's kind of similar with the gun and uh, Nameless and his brother Mose. Then we got Airplane Man. He meets the Airplane Man in a bar, right? Um, in, in Malta. And then he meets him again in Haver. Um, the Airplane Man came from New York where he... Okay, I'm glad they're going to clear this up because I was confused in the book. This encyclopedia.com says he comes from New York where he loved his wife, apparently taking some of her money. He says the FBI is looking for him. He, I think the reason why he calls the, him Airplane Man is because he's wearing stuff, right? He, and then he was like, Yeah, I left her on the runway or something, which, um, which you can't really do. I mean, maybe back then, but you can't like go on the runway and it doesn't happen anyway. Um, then you got Dogi, who's the drifter who lived with the narrator's grandmother. And this is the reason why the narrator thinks he's half white, because that's who he assumed was his grandfather. Then there's Dougie. Dougie is Agnes's brother. And he meets Dougie in a bar. And he was like, I'm trying to find your sister because she stole my stuff. And then Dougie was like, well, I, I don't know what to tell you. But you know what he does? He's like, but help me get this drunk guy into the bathroom and steal all his money. <laughs> right. So they carry this drunk guy into the stall. Dougie steals his money. Doesn't Dougie get him beat up in the bar? Like later yeah, in the book? Yeah, but that's later on in the book, yeah. So there was a point when he, I think this was when he found Agnes and they were in the bar and then all of a sudden Dougie had arranged something basically to beat up the narrator and then whatever. Um, first raise is the narrator's father, grandmother, or they call her old woman a lot. Mm -hmm. um, LaRue Henderson is an acquaintance of the narrator in Harlem. I don't remember her. Not gonna lie. Who the hell is LaRue? Interesting. Fernadan Horned. Fernadan Horn is a friend of the narrator's family. Oh, was he? Who's that? The guy that, <laughs> that comes to visit and he's like, where's your wife? I saw her. Oh, because him and the wife were like, yeah, wait, you should go get her. Who's the guy that was helping Lane Bull and the narrator on the... I thought that was Lane. Wait, no. Long, long knife. Long, no. Long, yeah, 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 yeah. Long okay. knife. We read the book, we promised. Yeah, we did. Lame Bull is Teresa's friend who becomes her husband. Oh, Longknife. Yes, Raymond Longknife. Malvina is a woman that the narrator meets in a bar in Harlem. One, um, night, stand. one night stand. Is she the bartender or no? Because he has these very Maybe. odd encounters with these women. Stays night at her house. So. I think Malvina is the woman that he meets in the bar. And then Marlene is the one that he meets after he gets beat up. Yeah. Both of them he has sex with, and then he does something very strange to to them. Yeah. Um, I think with Malvina, she was asleep, and he went in her bedroom and was, like, touching her while she was asleep. And then she kind of woke up and was like, beat it. Very strange. Yeah. With Marlene, he got on top of her and, like, was sitting on top of her, like, stomach to, like, hold her down. And then he, like, punched her. It it didn't make it. It was just very strange, and it was um that was the one part when I was like, okay, I don't like this dude because I I feel like I kind of sympathize with him, but then I was like, I don't like him anymore. Yeah. Mose is his brother, and the narrator is that's who he is. Yep, Teresa is his mother. Yolo Calf is blind man. The blind man who he later finds out is his actual grandfather. That's it. And there we go for the characters now. Something very controversial that I'm going to say here and that we have in our notes. Rocio and Willow fight over this. <laughs> I think, and if you've read both books, you can also back me up here. I, I just think, Rocio, that the writing style is similar to The Catcher in the Right. Similar. Okay, don't. I just want to quote myself from yesterday, and I want to say, how dare you, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. end quote. End quote. Um, Compare <laughs> Catcher, Holden, Cauliflower, Holden, Cauliflower, to this book. 
the writing stuff maybe the writing does not compare I there's <laughs> similar stories they both lost important people to them they true, both are true, going true. through a journey yes of like being drunk and going through a mental uh, being traumatized, traumatized and yeah all this but the writing style I wouldn't not the not the plot the writing just style? I mean there were times in Winter in the Blood when we were like huh like I I reread the ending twice and I still don't know if I understand well maybe you should try harder next okay time. anyway um <laughs> I think the reason why I said that was because Ketrin the Ride does he Holden I let's hope let's just say here Rocio in episode two that we hope to never speak about Ketrin the Ride again. Yes. It may come up again. I really hope From not. From now on we'll just call it catchy. So in catchy <laughs> In catchy Holden just switches from time to time, place to place. And I yeah, feel yeah, like that... Yeah. It w- the, I was going to call him a name. He doesn't have one. Narrator in Winter in the Blood does the same thing. He's in Malta, and then he's back home, and then he's in Haver. And we're like, oh, whoa, 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 wait a minute. Um, so o- only that. Nothing else I would compare to Ketchy. <laughs> I was going to say, let me play Devil, <laughs> Devil's Advocate. Uh, but when... <laughs> if I could just play Devil's Advocate here... <laughs> That too. I just want to push back here. Um, but with Winter in the Blood, when he does go back, it's important stuff. Like, there's two things that he goes back to when he finds his father dead. And when he, um, what's it called? When he recalls how his brother died. Those are important things. Meanwhile, Holden, catchy, would be like, and I have my brother's mate. And I remember this one time, I did this, and I went on a walk, and then... <laughs> Like, it doesn't relate. <laughs> no, you're right. You're right. You're right. Because Holden just, um, Holden just, as we said last episode, Holden would be like, and then I look down at this piece of paper. And it reminds me that trees are dying. And it reminds me of the trees are dying. Speaking of dying. And then you're like, what, Holden, what are you talking about? But the narrator went in the blood. Yeah, he brings up these moments. And even though he brings up those two deaths quite a bit, he also brings up moments between he and his grandmother. He brings up, like, when he heard the story of who he thought was his grandfather, all these things that link to something. So, yeah, they are meaningful. It's just yeah. a little bit confusing. So, there's our controversy for... Yeah. And I would say that it was interesting because this person was drunk and were hangover most of the time. So, I felt like I was drunk and hungover because he was forgetting stuff. Right, you know? right, 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 right. It's, it makes sense, you know? Perfect, perfect. Okay. Well, Rocio, uh, why don't we tell everybody about them? <laughs> about the movie oh the movie <laughs> I mean you know me and Willow here not to speak for both of us but I will I don't think I don't think we ever enjoyed or at least I've never enjoyed the book adaptation the movie adaptation from a book they just don't do it they don't get it they, they don't get it they don't get it at all man they always I mean for those of you who who have read a book and then seen the adaptation the film adaptation or vice versa or only have seen like I know um um, what's that book? Little Fires Everywhere. I read Little Fires Everywhere last year, and then it was, but it it had already been made into the Hulu series. Yeah. But there are some people who have seen the Hulu series without even reading the book. I haven't seen it. I'm not gonna watch it. They just there's too many details that they skip. Yeah. It's some. It's often inaccurate. They yeah. beef up a lot of parts. So yeah. And I just want to say, since we're talking about this, Divergent. I am so personally hurt and victimized because that <laughs> book to movie sucked. They, yeah, like you said, I agree. There was missing points, but then they added stuff. They added a random character. For what reason? And it will make you think as you're watching it, did I read the book? Because you're like, I didn't even... I don't remember this part. There were some parts in, in the Winter in the Blood movie that um, just flat out didn't happen in the book. Oh, yeah. um, there were some characters they used in different ways, and we were like, Rocio and I were... We were watching it on YouTube together... But also on Zoom, and so there were some parts when we were like, "Can we pause here? What? Who is that? And where does she come from? And how does that?" Yeah. Um, I think one of the biggest things was they kind of um, fabricated the closeness between the narrator and his grandmother. Oh, yeah. That was not. He never said he was close to her in the book. Really, they didn't really seem to have much of a relationship. But he seemed like the closest person to her in the movie, yeah. which it was nice. It just. Yeah. It didn't really, yeah, because even when he when she passes away, at one point, I don't know if because he's drunk or whatever, he was like, oh, I forgot she died. Like he, right. like it was just a very distant relationship. Very much, like it was like she's always rocking on her chair. 
and doing nothing. I don't know. It was, yeah. Yeah, don't quite get it. So if we had to give the movie a separate review out of four stars, what would, what would we get? Out of four stars? Yeah. I would say um, 1.5 to 2 maybe. That's a good you know, range, yeah. Kind of what we talked about the book, there's a lot of different scenes that go back and forward and then you go back in memory. So when they also take those sequ- those that story and then move scenes around it makes it even more confusing because you're just like it's already hard to keep up with the book scenes and sequence and timeline so now you're doing all of this and you're just like well, what mm-hmm. yeah i'm gonna give it like a 1.67 oh wow, that's harsh because I, okay. I yeah i didn't really like we finished the movie and we both were like um do we like it or i don't really that's still 42 percent that's a really good rating. 42%? Yeah, that's good. Actually, it's not that harsh. It's an F. It, for you. What is the TikTok? For you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Time for the book report. Uh, okay. So in Goodreads, uh, the average rating was a 3.86 out of 5. And this particular person gave it a 2 out of 5. And their rating says... I wished I liked this book more. Between the lusterness narration and the confusing plot, quote, uh, parentheses, I was never really sure what exactly the story was supposed to be about, and parentheses, I found it really hard to enjoy reading this. Um, there were a few scenes here and there that held my interest, but for the most part, it was quite a track. I feel like I would have appreciated the symbols and mo- motifs more had I been in English class on my own. They went over my head. It's a, Oh, wait. On my own, they went over my head. It's a shame I can't rate this higher because this novel is supposed to be a liter- literary masterpiece. On Amazon, we have a little bit of a higher rating with a 4.6 out of 5. And this particular person gave it a 4 out of 5. Uh, so Welch's view of the Fort Belknap area is too true and accurate. I grew up in Harlem, which is about 4 miles from the reservation. He has captured the essence of the people and the countryside. The story is dark and true to the life of the, on the res. Uh, that's what he refers it to. And it's, a pretty, ooh, and it's not a pretty picture or a feel-good story. I don't know if the conditions are better now than they were in the 50s, but I doubt it. Well, though. Mm-hmm. Um, so, library thing. Average rating was 3.67 out of 5. Uh, I pulled a review from a user named Terpsichorius. So Terpsichorus, if you hear this, we love you. Um, What is a strong word? One of us loves you. Well, we're reading your review. Yeah. Uh, This person gave it two stars. Quote, falls prey to the flowery slash boring prose problems of most contemporary American authors. And unlike in Harry Potter. (laughs) (laughs) Harry Potter? I know. I I know. That's why I'm pulling it. Okay. It's so funny. Um. And unlike in Harry Potter, there is no driving plot line to keep the reader's interest. However, comma, I will say that Welch's prose is often rises. That's not correct grammar. Um, I will say that Welch's prose often rises from his ilk Mm -hmm. and actually spins to get from his ilk, from his silk. I don't know. I have no questions. Should have proofread that. Um, and actually spins together an interesting metaphor or underlies a moment of subtle emotion. And that was a two-star review. Barnes & Noble, the average rating was 3.4 out of 5. This review is from Ben Wiss... N- Wiss... You must say the last names. Ben. <laughs> 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 Woo! Benny. I mean... I mean, they can see his last name if they go on the... Well, and there aren't that many. Ben W. This one's for you. This one's for, for you, from Ben. From you. From you, but also for you. Yeah. Quote. Oh God, this is a long one. Um, said, that's what she said. Windsor in the Blood is a shockingly benign tale of an unnamed rancher in Montana in the, mid, in the mid-1950s. Oh, 1950s. I feel like he's wrong. <laughs> <laughs> okay. You heard it here first, Ben. You're wrong. And his many experiences with trauma. Oh, I, I cut this post down because it was way too long. Winter in the Blood was a different kind of book to read and an interesting book to write about, due mostly to the fact that I am not sure it was about any particular thing. Characters come and go without any grandeur. 
course, you had to use the word grandeur. Others die suddenly. I don't think that's true. And animals are treated as nothing more than objects occupying time and space. No, they're not. Well, well move on. The only meaning that I can comprehend from the book is the stark reality of life. The fact that almost nothing matters and life will go on regardless of who or what lives or dies, much to the dismay of those that do... Ben, That's deep. what is this sentence? The fact that almost nothing matters and life will go on regardless of who or what lives or dies, much to the dismay of those that do care. I'm not sure what I just read. In some way, I think that this could be a metaphor specifically for life on Native American reservations and the seeming indifference of outsiders and the government concerning the poverty and crime that rid the lands of these once great and powerful peoples. However, comma, this is for the reader to decide. And despite the bleak sounding nature of the novel, I do believe it is worth a read. Now, Ben's review was way longer than that. And from what I read, you would think he didn't give it a good review, but he gave it four stars. Yeah. Um, so, Ben, Terpsichorius, Nella, and anonymous Amazon reviewer. Yeah, I forgot to put the names. It's okay. Nice. They, they know who they uh, are. Yeah. Um, thanks, y'all. Rocio, what would you give Winter in the Blood? Yeah, well, thank you for asking, Willow. I like that you are concerned with my review. I would give it a 3.75543 out of 5. <laughs> <laughs> I liked it. I enjoyed the writing style. She just looked at me. <laughs> <laughs> I enjoyed reading it in the morning. I enjoyed so I read in the morning and this book compared to Catchy RIP. I enjoyed reading in the morning. I it was nice. It was a good read. Uh, I was confused sometimes, not gonna lie. Like we talked about the plot went in and out and memories and blah blah blah. But I think it would have also have helped. Wow, it would have also have helped if maybe I was in an English class, maybe. So like I could have known some of the metaphors and the analysis of it. Um, you know, because now that I know some of it, I would reread it and. Especially, yeah, especially with the information I know now. And compared to me never wanting to reread, you know, Catcher in the Rye, that says a lot. Well, I guess maybe not, because Catchy's kind of... Well, if you know, you know. <laughs> um, but, yeah. Yeah. 3.75. What, what was the actual number you said? 3.75? 456. If you were going back to recheck that number, please don't. <laughs> um... Willow, what would you give it? Thanks for asking, Rocio. You're so well, sweet. Uh, actually, Willow, now that you mention it, I am very curious as to what you would give this book. Mm -hmm. Specifically, the book that we read today. Oh, oh just this one. Yeah. Not the other six. Yeah. Yeah, this winter in the blood. This winter in the blood, not the summer in the blood. Okay, yeah. so I would give this a three point man point oh two seven five two nine four out yeah, of five. Yeah, not a three point seven zero four three one. I think that's too high. Yeah. If my number was more than that, please no one check it. <laughs> um, here's my here's my thoughts. I said, um, I think I liked it. There were some moments that were easy to get lost in the artful language of, some confusing moments, but I think the beauty of this story lies in the fact that it isn't trying to be riveting or even super compelling, but honest. It's a subtle book. I mean, I think something we'll see when I always talk about is will we read this again? Like, do we never want to talk about it? Do we never want to look up, look at it again? I would read this book again. Mm -hmm. um, not soon, but again. Um, wait, wait, now that you said the beauty of the story lies in the fact that it isn't trying to be riveting or even super compelling. I remember uh -huh. everything you said. I'm not reading it from script. Um, I just remember that I read somewhere that the reason he doesn't have a name is because he's, he's not, he doesn't do anything. So he doesn't, so James Walsh didn't feel like giving him a name. He's like, well, he's not doing anything, so why does he need a name? Jimmy, you, know? you are so smart, Jimmy W. <sighs> Let me tell you something, Jim. Can I call you Jim? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm his representative. <laughs> I agree. Jim, what a smart move. Right? If Jerome... Oh my God, Jerome. ...had not given Holden in catchy a name maybe that i said would have hated it yeah i was gonna try to compare the, no no way also another big thing this book was a hundred and something pages catchy was 200 and something 
Rocio, oh, no. can you imagine if this book was double the amount of? I mean, I think by the time it ended, we were like, yeah, that makes sense. I think if he had added another. 150 pages we would have been like jimmy come okay dude it would have still been better than catch you though and that's um my word and that's on what do the kids say and that's on mary had a little lamb that's on mary had a little lamb kids youths anyway um one of my favorite quotes i can't tell you where like what page is on because i don't know but somewhere in the book someone says sometimes you have to lean into the wind to stand up straight and i mean Deep. Deep. Sna snaps. Poetry snaps for that one. Oh, and um, yeah, that's it for Winter in the Blood by James Welch. Um, that is the context. And that let us, is... Let us know what you think. Do you agree? Do you think this has a similar writing style like other people in this podcast that we will not name? Do you think that's true? Let who's, us know. Because... Whose name rhymes with Schmillo Mames? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, let us know. We're going to put, you know, this episode will be out in April. April. Yes, thank you, for because I <laughs> forgot. Um, but we're going to ask y'all, what did you think? For those of you that are reading along with us or that have read this book already or even are familiar with some of his other writings, um, you know, what did you think? How many stars would you give it? But that is all we got for Winter in the Blood by James Welch. Thank you for listening. If you want to stay in touch with us, you can email us at wereadbookpod at gmail.com. If you want to find us on social media, you can find us at We Read Bookcast on Facebook and Instagram. Also, um, is there something else that I should be saying? Facebook, Instagram. They, oh, if you want to find us on YouTube, you. just type in the name of our podcast that's what we read a bookcast and you can find all of our episodes maybe some special bonus things when we get there maybe. and also rocio we got a new thing we do we do we have we discussed this we did yesterday okay we, <laughs> we have an account on goodreads oh, right yeah so right. if you want to follow us you can Go to goodreads.com slash we read bookcast or just type in the name of our podcast. There you will find what we're reading, what we've read. We're going to update the reviews in real time. So we're not going to like review the next book that we're reading before the podcast drops. And then we also have a book club so that you can, we'll post like discussion questions Ooh. and put some forms in there. That's hot. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, it's, you know, look us up on Goodreads. Yeah, because if you don't have a Goodreads, like, I hate to tell you this, but. I mean, I mean this in the nicest way, but, but what, what are you, are you doing? doing? <laughs> in conclusion <laughs> in conclusion <laughs> hey yo stay tuned for next month's episode and we will be talking about the alchemist so that is that thank you for listening to that's what we read a bookcast freak yeah